Well, thank you. It is a real pleasure to be here in beautiful Banff. I've not been here before, so it's a wonderful opportunity. And to join such a uh, packed day of hepatitis C research, uh, my perspective really is one of clinical. I started focusing on hepatitis C therapeutics in around 1995. And we'll talk a bit about where we've come and what we're doing now with respect to antiviral therapy. I'm going to try to touch on some of the opportunities, but also some of the challenges that face off. And hopefully throughout the day, from looking at the topics, that these will be discussed in more detail. So I've got about uh, 20 or 30 minutes to do that. So without further ado, let me uh, first show you my disclosures and then move on to talk about the evolution of this uh, disease from a non-A, non-B hepatitis uh, to hepatitis C and now eradication. I think one of the things that's remarkable is just the rapid translation of basic uh, laboratory-based findings to clinical trials and now to the community. In many ways, that's happened over about 25 years. We start with the identification of non-A, non-B. After the Australia antigen was discovered, it became quite clear there was still an additional pathogen in the blood supply with Harvey Alter's early presentations. It became also clear about 30 years ago that you could treat non-A, non-B with interferon injections. And as depicted in the figure, when you gave interferon, the ALT level normalized, and in some people it stayed normal, other people it rebounded. And it wasn't until the late 1980s uh, where the uh, new technology allowed the discovery of the hepatitis C virus, and we began to understand the implications of this virus, and also begin the work of identifying strategies to target the virus replication cycle. And it's really been this, the laboratory work to identify the steps in hepatitis C life cycle replication, the interactions with the host, that have led to the development of drugs that can target a number of these steps. Now, I won't touch on all of them, but the entry mechanisms have been more or less identified. There's still some work to do, and there have been efforts to investigate entry inhibitors, uh, some in, in patients. I participated in a clinical trial of an SRB1 inhibitor. It was not particularly effective, but then again, we're not sure how we should be testing entry inhibitors in this context. I'll, I'll highlight the key places where we have had success at the protease, number three in this slide, uh, protease inhibitors first successful in HIV treatment were an early target uh, to block the cleavage of the polyprotein. So protease inhibitors have moved forward. We'll talk a bit about those. Steps four, five, and six, this membranous web formation followed by the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and then this lipoprotein assembly linked NS5A. What we've learned is this NS5A glycoprotein appears to be involved in each one of these steps, four, five, and six, potentially explaining its potent and rapid antiviral activity, both blocking the release of assembled virus as well as uh, interference replication complex. And finally, there's some cellular targets that I won't touch on today. I'm going to focus on the antivirals, but it's clear that host pathways, including cyclophilin and MIR-122, are involved in replication. Indeed, there are therapeutic uh, strategies that have been investigated quite successfully to target these. But I'm going to walk through the antiviral development and kind of where we are today. And the remarkable thing in 2015 is, at least in the United States, interferon is no longer recommended as a first-line therapy. So it went from 86 until uh, 2015 when interferon had its day. What instead is recommended is combination antiviral therapy. These are, have been highly successful. And I'll talk about some of the data that support this. But in general, what you can see, if you look at the Nuke NS5B column, these strategies break down to those that are based on a nucleoside nucleotide analog polymerase inhibitor, which has a high barrier to viral breakthrough or resistance selection, and when combined with other agents, is highly effective. So the bottom uh, several rows, or three rows, are those strategies that include a nucleotide analog NS5B inhibitor. The last row I'll touch on briefly is the idea of combining three very potent strategies, NS3 protease, NS5A, as well as a, not, a nucleoside analog polymerase inhibitor. Now the upper, stra upper uh, rows represent ways to combine other uh, antivirals, including ribavirin, and I'll spend a bit of time on ribavirin because this is a much maligned, often hated, but highly effective antiviral for hepatitis C that remains from the era of interferon and ribavirin. So focusing on the protease inhibition, what you see is the first protease inhibitor to be tested in human beings. 
BILN 2061, uh, presented at the liver meetings in 2012, the AASLD. Very potent, very effective. This was published in Nature. Unfortunately, long-term toxicity, 24 weeks of exposure in monkeys, led to cardiac toxicity. We now know that 24 weeks is not necessary, but this uh, was a bit of a setback. The next person here to come along was tilapavir. There was initial excitement that monotherapy looked quite effective over a, uh, a couple of days, but as the figure depicts, resistance was selected relatively quickly. These are associated variants in the bottom figure uh, typically have cross resistance to other protease inhibitors that are currently in clinical development. We'll talk about this issue of resistance as we go forward. And particularly, this position 155 was a problem with these first generation protease inhibitors. NS5A inhibitors, as I mentioned earlier, have become really quite interesting. Uh, this uh, single dose declatizivir study was first presented at WSLD, it was a poster. It later was published in Nature because it's truly remarkable that a single dose led to a four log viral load decline uh, in these patients. And as the figure to the right suggests, it was sustained over a period of up to a week. This rapid decline in 24 hours almost certainly linked uh, to assembly and release of virus in addition to activities both interacting with the polymerase as well as membranous web formation. Now, resistance is also an issue. Both pre-existing variants, Dennis 5 as are common. As many as 15% of patients with genotype 1 will have pre-existing variants. And as the upper figure depicts, with dosing over 14 days, every patient becomes resistant or selected resistant uh, to this uh, agent. Now, the figure along the bottom suggests that among the currently used uh, NS5A inhibitors, the clasvir, ambitosvir, and lidiposvir, there is cross-resistance. Keep that in mind because one of the things I failed to highlight on my figure of regimens is they almost all, except a few, share an NS5A inhibitor. This is a focus where we have generally incorporated one of these in all of the regimens, a bar a couple. So what happens if you put these two mechanisms of action together, combine a protease plus an NS5A? Well, this led to the first report of an interferon-free cure for some, but not most patients. This regimen of declasvir and asinopavir, first presented at EASL in 2011, later published in the Journal of Medicine, what you can see is that some patients, given these two oral drugs, did have sustained HCVRNA negativity, but others broke through. The analysis of the resistance associated variants showed these patients broke through with resistance to both the PI, protease inhibitor, as well as the NS5A. So this clearly was a strategy showing it was possible to eradicate hepatitis C, but perhaps the combination of just these two drugs was not sufficient. More recently, we've seen that perhaps the real issue is what is the barrier to resistance that this regimen presents? And one of the challenges with the previous regimen was that for patients with 1A infection, pre-existent variants that conferred uh, decreased susceptibility to both asinopavir and others to declatizivir were common in patients, and they were rapidly selected. But in this recently published study, uh, the combination of elsevier and grizopavir, this is a uh, perhaps a second-generation protease inhibitor. This was studied in patients uh, with and without HIV co-infection depicted in the figure, and the sustained virologic response rates were in the 90% or higher range using just two drugs. And the answer to this may be that this particular protease inhibitor, as depicted in the box, is active against this common variant at position 155, the R155K variant. So perhaps you can target the virus if you use the right medications with the right barrier to viral breakthrough. We'll come back to that theme. Now, I'm going to move on to talk about the polymerase. I'm going to first talk about non-nucleoside polymerase inhibitors. These are, uh, which I term non-nukes, these are allosteric. They, they uh, target allosteric binding sites on the polymerase, and there are multiple non-nucleoside polymerase inhibitors that were uh, tested. Now, well, the thing I want to point about this one that's depicted in the, uh, the figure this is Dusabavir. Dusabavir is part of the so-called 3D regimen. This was a three-day monotherapy study. It was presented at EASL in 2012. They gave people monotherapy, then a full regimen. During the three-day dosing with a non-nucleus inhibitor Dusabavir, the viral load reduction was one log. Not a particularly potent antiviral. NS5A, three to four log. 
uh, NS3 protease, about three to four log. Here we're at one log. So the question is, what role would this have? And in one of the first studies with this particular agent, the combination of uh, paratapavir, ritonavir, and disabavir uh, led to a very high SVR rate in most patients. But there's a very curious finding in this study, uh, eventually published in New England Journal of Medicine. And the top figures are those who were treatment naive. Hepatitis C gene type 1, no prior treatment. Along the bottom are patients who had failed peg interferon or ribavirin. And what's depicted in the figure is their viral load suppression. And you can see in the red that failure occurred far more often if the patient had been previously treated with interferon. Now, we still don't fully understand what's going on here. Why does a person who failed interferon not respond as well as those who have never been treated? Is it selection of resistance to interferon and or ribavirin? Or perhaps what you're really identifying is an individual, a host, that does not handle hepatitis C very effectively from an immunologic perspective. One way to think about it is these patients had two opportunities to clear. They had a spontaneous opportunity, which they did not clear. Then they were given interferon, and they did not suppress. So they really are immunologically uh, somewhat incompetent when it comes to this virus. And this regimen perhaps was not effective enough. So what if you look at adding more drugs? And this study brings in uh, the NS5A inhibitor on bitazvir. This was a very nice study that Chris Cowley published in New England Journal of Medicine in early 2014. And what they did is test the contribution of each drug. So if you start with the, what we now know is the 3D regimen, and you remove the NS5A on bitazvir, we see that the viral failure rate goes to 12%. What if we take away Dasabavir, this relatively weak one-log antiviral drug? 10%. This suggests that targeting the polymerase, in addition to the uh, NS3 and NS5A, this extra uh, target does indeed lead to perhaps a synergistic antiviral effect. And what about ribavirin? Well, when ribavirin was removed, 7.6% failure rate. But if you put all of them together in this phase two study, the failure rate is only 1.2%. And this is a case where looking at the failure rate is more informative than looking at the SVR rate. I know the clinical trial uh, design experts will say, well, we must look at intention to treat. But that doesn't necessarily tell us the contribution of each antiviral. That's really depicting the failure. So one of the things I'd urge you to do when you look at clinical trial reports, don't just look at the SVR look at the failures, they're far more informative, and they may tell us what we have to worry about in the future. So is ribavirin really important? Well, it is for 1A patients. For patients with 1B infection, we know that the <coughs> ability to escape the combination of NS5A and protease is relatively difficult. A 1B, there was only one viral breakthrough in the phase three clinical trials. These are the PEARL studies. But if you look at 1A patients, the overall difference in SVR or cure was 7%. But if you look at the failure, no ribavirin, 16 patients, six breakthrough, 10 relapse. Look at with ribavirin, that drops to two patients. So clearly ribavirin is contributing something to this pathway. I'll come back to the, re the resistance associated variants at the time of failure in just a minute. So what does ribavirin do? Well, I'm not sure I can answer that question. Perhaps Jordan Fell will tell us later, as he's certainly looked into this topic. But if we go back to the telapavir peg ribavirin study, the PROVE-2 study is depicted in the figure where the removal of ribavirin from telapavir or protease, peg interferon, no ribavirin, the breakthrough rate was 24%. If you add ribavirin, it fell to 1%. And in fact, the most potent effect of any of the drugs in that combination was ribavirin. It delivered more in terms of a delta than telapavir. And in an early study combining several uh, antiviral agents, the upper figure shows patients who did not get ribavirin. And you see really two things. The uh, IL-28B haplotype of the patient had an impact, as did the use of ribavirin. In the lower figure, providing ribavirin prevented viral breakthrough. What does ribavirin do? Perhaps the best way I've come to think about it is it prevents the emergence of selected variants. So in every patient, there is an hepatocyte that likely has resistant virus to every drug you're using. And ribavirin prevents that from being expanded. In order to break through, 
that variant must be transmitted to other cells, must expand, and then emerge in the patient's blood. Ribavirin seems to prevent that. I'm not entirely sure how. The other thing that's emerged is that patients with cirrhosis and prior failure are more difficult to cure. All the way to your right in this study of 3D regimen plus ribavirin, so NS5A, NS3, uh, dusabavir plus ribavirin, in prior null responders to peganiferin ribavirin who have cirrhosis, 24 weeks of therapy is significantly more effective than 12 weeks, 95 versus about 87%. So there's something about, as we talked about earlier, the prior peg ribavirin failures, which I think is an immunologic deficit, but there's also something about the cirrhotic liver, which folks have speculated may be due to a perfusion of the cirrhotic liver, yet the liver cells are alive, suggesting they are being perfused, and we know that we do deliver these drugs quite effectively to the liver through a first-pass metabolism for many. So I'm not sure how we explain cirrhosis. My own view is that it may actually be immunologic as well, representing a dysfunction of the cirrhotic liver where the immune system within the liver is simply non-functional. Now what about co-infection? Well, some of the good news here is that co-infection does not appear to impact SVR rate very much. This is data from a recently published study in JAMA. It was presented online a couple of days ago. 12 and 24 weeks of co-infected patients receiving antiviral therapy for both uh, viruses was quite effective. Now, there is a, a point here I'll highlight in the table. I realize it's difficult to read. But there were four patients who did not achieve SVR. Two appear to be based on virologic uh, failure, a breakthrough and then a relapse, both in null responders to peganiferin and ribavirin with cirrhosis, that, that tough to treat phenotype, if you will. But two were negative four weeks out, both engaged in high risk sexual practices, which led to reinfection between post treatment week four and 12. So they are counted in intention to treat as failures, but they're really reinfections uh, based on careful analysis. And we're seeing that more and more in clinical trials. And Andrew Hill recently uh, presented a meta-analysis suggesting that co-infected patients may have a reinfection rate as high as 23% in the available data, something we need to keep in mind as we deliver these drugs. I'd like to move on to talk about the nucleotide analog NS5B polymerase inhibitors. This is sofosbuvir. It was uh, developed and first published in 2010. One of its real claims to uh, uh, efficacy is that it is very difficult for the virus to escape. This targets the highly conserved active site, and the, NS, uh, and the mutations are really uncommon, both in patients treated as well as uh, at baseline prior to treatment. It is also active against genotypes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. I'll get to that point. It was given as monotherapy. Now, with protease and NS5A, if you gave monotherapy, you would see viral breakthrough. Yet in this study by Ed Gang, which was published in, uh, it shows actually some patients got sofosbuvir alone, yet they did not have viral breakthrough during their course. Now subsequently, there's been at least one patient who broke through during monotherapy, and we have one at our site as well. But this, this was not seen with other targets, the ability to give monotherapy without breakthrough. Unfortunately, eradication did not occur without ribavirin all that often. <laughs> ribavirin, a relatively weak antiviral as measured by traditional methods, did achieve SVR in these patients. It led to the uh, fission, fusion, and positron studies of soft ribavirin for genotype 2 and 3, which remain the standard care today. Now, I do want to comment that although the nucleotide analog is a key element to much of our therapy today, the development of additional drugs has been relatively arduous. Uh, to your right is a recently published uh, analysis of what happened with a Inhibitex guanosine nucleotide analog polymerase inhibitor. What's depicted here along the bottom is duration of exposure to this agent and the proportion who developed congestive heart failure through myocardial dysfunction. This medication delivered or caused myocardial dysfunction, including the death of one patient. So it is easy to focus on the successes we've had, but I would remind everyone there have been a lot of drugs developed that were indeed harmful or ineffective, and this class has been challenging. 
There is one additional nuke, if you will, that is moving on into phase two and hopefully uh, further. This is a drug that Merck is developing. It's a uridine, much like sofosbuvir. The uridines appear to have a safer profile. The guanosines are all but defunct with respect to hepatitis C. And you can see that there is a potent antiviral activity over, again, seven days of monotherapy dosing. What about if you combine this with other drugs? Well, some of the early experiments have shown here the clasvir in NS5A was tested. And there's a very interesting phenomenon in the first seven days. Some patients took sofosbuvir monotherapy. The argument was you should knock the virus down, then add the NS5A. And what you can see is if you get both at the same time, rapid viral decline. The, the other patients catch up. But what's interesting is it was not advantageous to give them stagger. It was better to give them the same time. And you can again see this rapid contribution of NS5A. To the right is the addition of Simipravir, a NS3 protease inhibitor in the so-called COSMO study. Very high rates of sustained virologic response among null responders to interferon ribavirin, including serotics, given these two tablets uh, for either uh, 12 or 24 weeks. Now, this regimen was used aggressively in the United States over the last year as it was recommended by the U.S. Guidelines Panel for Use and recently approved by the FDA. What's been more recently put into place has been the combination of a, a single tablet, fixed dose combination, of lidipasvir and sofosbuvir. And what you can see is 8 weeks, 12 weeks, 24 weeks, with or without ribavirin. The ribavirin did not appear to contribute to higher SVR rates. And the SVR rates for eight weeks were as high as 94%, going up to around 99% with 24 weeks of therapy. If we focus in the bar at the relapse, it was about 4.6% for eight weeks, 2% for, or 0.6% uh, for 12 weeks, and 0.2% for 24 weeks. Now, in the United States, the FDA recommended eight weeks if the viral load were less than 6 million IU per ml at baseline, in those patients, the relapse is only 2%, still higher than 12 weeks, but given the cost of the medication, this is being used commonly for eight weeks. Now, what about the cirrhotic patients with prior non-response? Well, this regimen is not immune to this. This is an analysis that was presented at the liver meetings about in the fall, in the American liver meetings, and uh, will be published uh, shortly in a randomized controlled trial testing lidipasvir sofosphere plus ribavirin, versus lidipasvir sofosbuvir alone for 24 weeks, similar response rates among cirrhotic prior treatment failures, suggesting that maybe you can overcome this challenge, if you will, by adding ribavirin or extending therapy. So if we look at the meta-analysis, now that study, although it was a nicely designed placebo-controlled trial, was only 77 patients. And the authors did not actually present a, uh, a power calculations, but I'm confident it's under power to really compare these two regimens. So what was done was an integrated analysis of 513 cirrhotic patients in the table. 12 weeks, no ribavirin. Treatment naive patients, 96%. Treatment failure patients, 90%. If you add ribavirin, it goes up to 96%. If you extend therapy, it goes 98%. If you do both, ribavirin plus 24 weeks, 100%. Now, this latter strategy is what's being used for uh, patients who fail with resistant variants, and I'll talk a bit more about that. What about HIV co-infection? These data from ION4 were presented yesterday at uh, the CROI meeting in Seattle, and a single tablet for 12 weeks led to 96% SVR in this patient population. There are some issues with drug interactions that we can discuss, uh, and there was also some concern about a higher relapse rate among black patients, which is not fully explained, but may represent a constellation of host as well as drug interaction issues, which requires more research. But co-infection did not appear, impair SVR. So what's the impact of drug resistance? Well, this is data taken from the U.S. prescribing information. Among patients who fail with dipasvir and sofosbuvir, no one appeared to have resistance to sofosbuvir. However, 62% had NS5A resistance. If you failed the 3D regimen, about a half the patients had resistance to the NS5A, the protease, and the non-nuke NS5B. And you can see that these patients 
uh, in a sense, you may ask yourself, how should I retreat that patient? If I use lead soft to retreat a 3D failure, well, there's cross resistance at umbidosphere or ludiposphere. But there's this intriguing N of 1 study. You can't over-interpret N of 1 studies, but this was a patient treated for eight weeks. He rebounded with both soft resistance as well as NS5A resistance. The investigator, without waiting for any virologic data to come back, retreated the patient with the same regimen, this time adding ribavirin and extending therapy. And what's a bit remarkable is that this patient then suppressed and achieved an SVR. I can't tell you that this is the answer to failure because frankly an end of one study is not enough to comfort me in my practice, but this is what's being investigated, longer therapy adding ribavirin. So that's led in the United States to uh, the recommendations for treatment of all patients. Uh, what it says is tantamount, uh, hepatitis C SVR is tantamount to a virologic cure, and as such, all patients are expected to benefit. So they've also gone on to say the treatment goal is to prevent liver death and other outcomes, and the co-infected patients should be treated like mono-infected patients. This is a, a nice meta-analysis that Andrew Hill conducted showing SVR, both in all-cause mortality as well as hepatocellular carcinoma, including co-infected patients. So there is, I think, a growing body of data that's based on nearly 35,000 patients that it is beneficial to eradicate virus. These are the regimens recommended in the United States. I won't go into detail, but you need to know three things. Subtype, if you're treating genotype 1, A or B. Cirrhosis, yes, no. Prior treatment experience, naive or experienced. And that changes whether or not you use ribavirin, whether or not you treat for 12 or 24 weeks, whether or not you're a candidate for eight weeks. But it's a relatively simple algorithm at this point in time to be more complicated when other regimens are approved. But what we don't necessarily have yet is the perfect combination. I'll spend the last couple of minutes talking about what Dr. Feld has termed perfectivir. And this is a, a drug that can lead to a SVR of more than 90%. There are effective retreatment strategies. It works against all viruses, favors adherence, once daily uh, pills, or perhaps long-acting injectable nanoformulations, and it favors persistence that is short duration. We're not quite there yet, but there are studies underway. Now, why all genotypes? Well, globally, hepatitis C kills up to a half a million people, and you can see that genotype one is common, but certainly in many regions, perhaps in Egypt, there are as many as 12 million Egyptians with gene type 4. And if you look at Southeast Asia, gene type 3 is dominant. We need strategies for these. Gene type 4 is not really a problem with the drugs. This is a couple of studies put together. Ambitisvir, paratapavir works very well in gene type 4. So phospholidipasvir, very high rates in small studies. Simipravir, quite active in 4. Decladisvir, asinopavir. The clavuvir, very good in four. The problem here is getting the drugs to people with gene type four. It's not the drugs themselves. They work very well for four. Three is a different story. The drugs are not yet perfected for gene type three. Now, this was a study in the upper right hand corner of declasvir plus sofosvir for 12 weeks in co infected patients. You can see very high response rates across gene type one through four, but among cirrhotic, particularly treatment experience patients in the ally uh, three study along the bottom, the success rate was only 60% with 12 weeks. They need longer therapy, they need ribavirin, they need more drugs. Now, perhaps we will have a pan-genotypic single tablet relatively soon. The combination of sofosphere plus a second generation S5A, uh, 5816, is in phase three trials. In vitro, very potent activity against all strains, one through six, clinical trials are underway and completing soon. This could be available as early as 2016. Along the bottom is data from a phase two trial of patients who were enrolled with genotype one, two, three, four, five, and six, and the SVR rates are quite good. I'll point out there's only one genotype five patients. They're hard to recruit because clinical trials are difficult to do in South Africa where genotype five predominates. I'll also point out that the real role of this combination may be for genotype 3. Now, what about shorter duration of therapy? Well, four weeks, there was a lot of excitement about that. Uh, just published in The Lancet was the combination of a PI plus NS5A plus nuke. And as the viral kinetic curves show, there was a rapid decline if you added the protease. 
suggesting you may be able to clear infected hepatocytes more quickly. And in fact, they, they cured 95% treated for six weeks. But the sobering data from the liver meetings in the fall was that four weeks of a good PI, crisopavir, in NS5A and sofosbuvir eradicated virus in as only 38% of patients. The rest of them had virologic failure. In my mind, four, four weeks is simply too short. Now, perhaps better drugs, uh, better uh, other outcomes will be important, but I think four weeks, at least with what we're currently doing, is not going to work for most patients, but st studies are underway. So to summarize, I'm entitled this, It's the Virus Stupid, and those of you who know, followed HIV, back in 1996, uh, some famous HIV researchers from the Rockefeller New York were featured on Time Magazine, and they declared success because highly effective protease inhibitors formed heart, and they actually thought they could cure <laughs> HIV with just a, a certain period of time, maybe six months to a year. They were wrong. It's actually much more difficult to cure HIV, and that's the subject of a whole different discussion. I think it will be more difficult to eradicate hepatitis C. In fact, I think it's impossible. We can talk about control and elimination, but this is a major problem. We do have the tools now to begin to discuss this from an epidemiologic and global health perspective, but the issue here is, and what I hope I've shared with you this morning, is there's been a re remarkable and rapid translation from the discovery of hepatitis C in, in the late 80s to highly effective approved regimens. So we can treat and eradicate virus in most patients. We have some unanswered questions. How low can you go? What do we do with those who fail? But the real challenge now is the translation of, from clinical trials into the global community, so-called effectiveness research, and that's where we stand now. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Mark, for that outstanding overview. And, uh, very comprehensive. We just have time for a couple of quick questions, if anyone has any. Maybe I'll start with one. Um, I, I tend to agree with you that four weeks is going to be a challenge with the, the strategies we're using, but do you think um, something like a long-acting MIR-122 inhibitor or something like that might allow you to get away with short-duration DAs? Well, I think what we continue to see is that when you challenge, if you give people 12 weeks, let's say 24 weeks, it, it's clear that with 24 weeks of therapy, you can overcome host factors and viral factors. If you look at cirrhotic patients with NS5A baseline resistance, 12 weeks, they tend to fail. 24 weeks, you can overcome that. So what I think we see is that heterogeneity in both the host immune system, cirrhosis, whatever particular uh, immune function is measured by the interferon lambda-3 haplotype, we see that emerge. So I think when you try to cut short these so-called easy-to-treat patients from the interferon era, they, get, they can be sexually treated, but it's these patients with complexity that will need some help, and therein lies the use of immunologic agents like interferon, but the enthusiasm for interferon has dropped to an all-time low in the U.S., and uh, I really don't think that's an option. But it does bring into play other immunologic pathways or targeting MIR-122 or things like that. So I, I don't think we're done quite yet if we want to get short. Yeah, adipose tissue can interfere with drug interactions or, or the ability for drugs to work, certain drugs. And, and this has been seen in a number of disease um, situations. I was wondering with your genotype 3 um, results that you saw lower SVR rates, were um, these um, patients checked for fatty liver and, and to see if that was a complicating factor in this? Yeah, so certainly many of the patients with genotype 3 have uh, concurrent fatty liver, likely virally mediated. Uh, that, I don't know that that explains the failure specifically, at least based on the clinical trials being conducted. I think the real issue may be that some of the drugs, when they were designed, uh, the initial replicon models were based on genotype 1, and we've been kind of slow to tailor a therapy to genotype 3. But I think there is still this idea that gene type 3 behaves differently. There's evidence they progress more rapidly to cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, and death. So gene type 3 biologically behaves differently in inducing fatty liver. So there may also be uh, biologic differences to explain the harder to treat patients. We're not quite there yet in terms of the research. <laughs> 
But was fatty liver checked as a possible complicating factor? So fatty liver was measured not by biopsy. Liver biopsy uh, in many of these registrational phase three trials is no longer performed, but ultrasonography evidence of fatty liver was determined, it, at least in a simple model, fat, yes, no, it didn't appear, but in the absence of a histologic examination, it's hard to say that fat's been thoroughly examined. One final question and then we'll move on. Hi, I was just wondering if you could highlight again the um, bit about the ribavirin. Uh, you said it wasn't clear and I just quite missed what you suggested it could be, well, thank you. Yeah, so when, when one looks at the body of literature of ribavirin, it's been around for obviously a long time, um, and Dr. Fell could address this as well. I've seen him uh, struggle to answer this question in other forums. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, there was, a, I actually have to credit Alan Pearlson, the mathematician from Los Alamos. But uh, what, well, the, way I've, the way he presented it, and in the mathematical modeling, when you give ribavirin monotherapy, the viral load declines a mere 0.5 log, if that, uh, when measuring the classic path, the classic viral load reduction. But when you think about viral breakthrough, it's quite clear in every patient that pre-existing variants exist to whatever regimen you select. Doesn't matter if it's soft lead or some other regimen. And it's also almost certain that within 24 hours of dosing, you have hepatocytes that are full producing virus that's fully resistant to whatever regimen you're using. But in order to break through, that resistant virus needs to spread from those infected hepatocytes to adjacent hepatocytes or perhaps to ones in other parts of the liver. And what ribavirin appears to do is close the replication space so that that resistant strain can't spread. And breakthrough only occurs when there's enough infected hepatocytes replicating freely in the face of drug pressure to then emerge above what can be detected. So ribavirin appears to close the replication space, perhaps by uh, simply poisoning the uh, adjacent hepatocytes for infection. But I don't have any data to support that. But it was a, some modeling that Alan Perlson did um, that I thought was quite elegant. And as I sat there, I said, that actually makes sense. Um, all the other explanations, Jordan, uh, fell a little short for me. Very well done, Mark. <laughs> Nicely. So I think with that, we'll conclude. Thank you again, Mark, for a very uh, Thank you.